And our, our next speaker is Neil, Neil Wilkinson, who's an associate scientist at the Natural History Museum and Brunel University. I'll give you the microphone. Well, good morning. Um, this very fine object here is the Lysurgis cup. Anybody that's done physics may well have come across it because it's documented in lots of physics textbooks. Um, it's a remarkable object. It's in the British Museum. Sorry. Um, it's a remarkable object. It's, it's on show in the British Museum. And it's a one of a kind. Um, it's a fourth century Roman um, called the cage cup. It's called the cage cup because you can see behind the figures is a cup and the um, very, very special carving um, has, uh, it stands out from the, um, the central cup and it's the small bridges that go across to retain the figures um, and it's undercut, you can see, it's undercut in many places. So it's an absolutely remarkable bit of carving. Um, it's unique. Most cage cups are, um, have geometric patterns on, not figurative like this. And this, is, this cup tells the story of this is King Lysurgis, and um, he was a rather evil king, not very liked, and he tried to have his wicked way with a lady on the other side who's um, a nymph called Ambrosia. And she called upon the gods to turn her into a vine. And they did that. And you can see the vine is beginning to wrap around Lysurgis here. And um, he was dragged down into the underworld and died. Um, so it tells a story. Um, and the other, so the other remarkable thing about this is that it's dichroic. So the glass was specially made by craftsmen somewhere um, to uh, have a different color on the right. It's, you can see in, that's the light in transmission. And on the left-hand side is the light in reflection. So if you just put a light inside, it's red. Take it out immediately. It goes the green color. And it's that milky sort of green color there. And this is one of the first examples of nanotechnology. This is Roman's fourth century nanotechnology. And um, the other thing to note about it is that it's been later, probably 17th, 18th century, um, it's, been, it's had this rim put on and the base. And it would have, not, it would have actually stood right on the, on the cup itself. There would have been feet um, inside there. Um, so I was attracted to this because of this dichroic effect, and um, I'd done some work on this. In other, so I'm going to just uh, quickly talk about the history of this. There's lots and lots of uh, papers and things out there. It's if you do a Google search on this, you get about 128,000 hits. So it's 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 in everywhere. Um, I'm going to talk about how I got hold of the specimens, um, some optical work that I did because it's not had very much research done on the actual glass itself, and um, some X-ray tomography and how I turned from. Uh, the, these other techniques to transmission. This is my speciality, transmission electron microscopy. And then um, uh, there's a, there's a method, new method of sampling called FIB, focused ion beam. And certainly I, I'm, I'm here sort of promoting new technology because the previous work had been done with rather old technology. So the first mention of this was 1845. Um, a member of the, fa the very prestigious um, uh, banking family had acquired this object um, somewhere. Nobody knows the history of it. Nobody really knows where he bought it, but it was in the, in the Rothschild family. And um, I've put in this 1871 because Lord Rayleigh in Cambridge was working on colloids in liquids. And he noted that, um, that you got this dichroic effect on the liquids. And so others that followed referred to the work that Rayleigh had done. So it was acquired by the museum in 1958. There was some analyses done um, as soon as they acquired it. And there was this first publication in 1959. And then in 59 and 62, there were analyses done of bits of glass that um, I'll come to how they got them in a minute. And those two conferred, and 
we got the analysis of the glass. And it was noted that there was gold and silver in the glass at very, very low um, concentrations in the parts per million. Um, then in 1990, uh, David Barber and Ian Freestone made the first use of transmission electron microscope, and they were able to see only one or two of these nanoparticles. Um, in the meantime, between 1990 and 2013, there's loads and loads of publications on this, this phenomenon called surface plasmon resonance. And that's the effect that's working in this cup to give this beautiful red and purple color. I came along in 2013 as I was an application specialist for an electron microscope accessory provider. Bruno University had bought a new TEM. David Barber turned up with the specimens that he got from 1990, and I sat with the microscope all day. I looked through hundreds and hundreds of grains, didn't find any gold, silver nanoparticles. And um, so that triggered my imagination. I retired in 2020, and I got back to work on this in 2022. And so, this piece, so it's, you, you know, you, don't, you can't just go and chip a bit of, um, you know, a bit of material off this. Um, so, but um, by mistake, somebody in about 1850 had removed the base. And when they rattled it around, this piece, one of the feet had broken off and was sitting in the bottom of the, of the, the silver, the gold silver bit. And there were some other fragments. So those were used um, for the chemical analyses. And in 1990, um, Barber and uh, Freestone took the material, they crushed it between two glass slides to make lots and lots of bits of fragments like this. And they mounted them on the right there. That's the TEM grid. So it's a three millimeter grid, and it's got a film on it. And then they dispersed um, the, the fragments that they put on that grid. And that's what I looked at first of all, uh, the, these, these, um, these grids, of which there are two. They also made an, another few specimens which were completely unusable, and no wonder they didn't find anything in those. Um, and then. Um, so I got hold of these specimens. They'd been left in a cupboard in Bruno University. I knew they were there. And in June 23, I had a fib sample made, which changed everything. So I'm just going to take you through uh, some of the optical work I did. I wanted to be sure that anything I looked at had this dichroic property. So I started off doing optical work. I looked at hundreds and hundreds of grains. It's not very easy to see, but you can see this is slightly green, this central part uh, thing there. In the transmission microscope, you've got to get the beam right through the sample, so it's quite problematic. And you can't look at a big grain. You have to look at very small grains. And the probability of seeing this gold and silver in a small grain goes down. Um, then uh, at the Natural History Museum, they've got this um, wonderful 3D tomography uh, device. And so I took a sample gave it to them, and they looked at it with x-rays. So this is a sample that's been rotated around through 360 degrees, and you can see the internal structure, because what I wanted to see is, is this material homogeneous? The resolution of this technique is not good enough to see an individual particle, but if there was a layer or something like that, I'd probably see it here, and that proved negative. I then moved on to scanning electron microscopes, and I put a piece in the scanning electron microscope. I spent a few days looking. Nah, couldn't see anything, nothing at all. So they're too small, and they're too rare events. They're just in there. And if you look at the concentration here, um, this is the concentration of silver. So that's 30 parts per million, and there are four parts per million of gold. So it's very, very rare to, you know, to, it's, it's not, not much. Um, so the TEM is the best tool for the job. So this is the TEM at Bruno University. And um, is there any pointer on this? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so this is where the specimen goes here. And this is like an SEM, this bit here, the top bit. But you have other lenses here. And there are all sorts of accessories, analytical accessories that can sit underneath. So this, this is a very nice electron microscope. It's not current state of the art. It's about eight years old. But it has this STEM mode, which wasn't around in the days when, nine, when the, this was first looked at in a transmission electron microscope. And so there's this method called HAADF, high angle 
annular dark field imaging. And this is very, very good for picking out density. So this is the instrument I use. And I started by trying to get a mapping system going. Um, and, and so, uh, so I wanted to be able to go back to individual grains. And it's not that easy in a scanning electron microscope and then the transmission, because you have to take the specimen out every day. You can't leave it in overnight, etc. And so I started looking through this specimen. I, I found thousands and thousands of grains. I looked at thousands and thousands of grains. I spent hundreds of hours sitting at the electron microscope trying to find these gold nanoparticles. I had some success, I had more success than they had in 1990, but eventually, um, after looking at just met, you know, days and days of sitting at the microscope finding nothing, eventually I did actually find some, and you can see here, then these are the gold nanoparticles there. That's very unusual to find three in a grain that size. And if you look at this, this is just a few microns long. And so that's a very high density of, of particles compared to what the others uh, I'd seen. And you can see, here's another example. You can see a gold grain here and a gold grain there. They're often referred to as gold grains. Actually, they're not gold grains. They're silver and, go silver and gold, and they have a core shell structure, and it's, think it, I think it's gold at the center and it's silver on the outside. And so then, um, in terms of specimen preparation, there's, there's another way, there's a new way to make specimens. This is what you used to have to use in the old days. You had to grind a specimen so that it was very, very thin, and then fire two beams of, uh, of irons at it till it made a hole. And this technique is rather crude and really not very good, and the two specimens that um, that I, the 1990 people made in those, I couldn't see, I couldn't even find any thin areas, let alone find any gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles. This instrument's come along in fairly recent years. It's a very high resolution scanning electron microscope, and it has a normal electron column here, but this is an iron column. And so what you can do is, this is a new method of preparing specimens. So here's the grain, top left, and you can see on the top, the area, this, is, this grain's about half a millimeter or something like that. And you can see on the top, the area where the specimen has been extracted. And so what you do is, you lay down a platinum bridge, this thing here, on the specimen, and then you fire two electron beam, two iron beams at it, and you dig away at the material, so that what you've got is, standing underneath this, you've got this, here that you see on the bottom uh, left. And this can be made different thicknesses. The person I got to make, do this thought he would get, need to get it thinner, and actually he eroded it away with the electron beam. I would have liked it like the left, not like the right, but never, nevertheless. Um, instantly, when I looked at this sample, I could see a very high number, relatively high number. So, I've got 10 nanoparticles. This, this little specimen is five microns by five microns, and it's about 200 nanometers in thickness. And so from these images, I now know what the density of the particles is, because this color is critical. The density and the thickness of the sample are critical to getting this exact color. And I don't know whether you noticed, on the chest of Lysurgis, it's actually a different color, and that's because probably it's a different thickness. Nobody's measured the thickness of the, of the cup versus the chest. Um, and so here I am with a, my new sample, my fib sample, much, much easier to use, and I can see these things instantly. So then I can, go up in magnification, start looking at individual particles, and here's just some of them. And you'll note how there's a definite crystallinity to these. And you can see there's a crystal structure. And these are aggregates of gold in the, in the center and silver around the outside that form this very definite crystal shape. And I can put the electron beam on those and get X-ray spectra from it, from which I can tell the precise composition of the silver and gold, which is interesting to uh, people who make it, make these things. And I know that these, the average size is 74 millimeters. This is the one image that they showed in the 1990 paper. This is uh, one of two, and they got it pretty well right. They got uh, I've got 74 nanometers. Uh, that one measures 80 nanometers, and then. 
um, I was able to measure the volume. So this is a side view of my specimen, and there's the plan view of my specimen. I was able to measure the area of that and look at the, the, the side view to get the volume, and from there I can calculate the, the number of particles per unit area. Uh, sorry, per unit volume, and then from that, knowing that the cup's about three, um, three millimeters thickness, I can calculate the number of particles that the incident light or the, the transmitted light interacts with, which is what gives it its color. So it's a very, very clever um, combination of the right size particles, the right chemistry of particles, the right thickness of glass, and the right density. And so these are the profiles looking at the size. I can do that. And I can also, from each of the particles, I can put the electron beam on it. And this is, a, uh, this is a, an X-ray spectrum. You can see the gold and silver. And I can analyze this, and I can get the relative uh, composition of the gold and silver. And most of the particles, there, there's some variation in the particles. Most of the particles are silver rich, but there's one or two where, there, where there's more gold than silver. Um, and I've got lots of now, uh, I've got 22 shown here, but I've done, I've analyzed lots of, lots of particles. And so, uh, you know, fr going from just one particle detected um, in, in days gone by, and one analysis, I've now got a much, much better feel for why this works and how the plasmon resonance imaging is working to give us this beautiful object. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, do we have some questions from the audience? So did you do all of this from the sample that fell off when they took out the base? And do you still have any left, or have you used it all up? Uh, you still have some? Yeah. So, okay. You know, I, I'm looking at, I'm look, the ideal size for me is about a micron. Okay. And when they crush the samples in the glass, there's probably 200,000 there. <laughs> so yeah, Thank I've you. got enough. And I've got enough to make some, I've got enough to make, uh, to do, make some more fib samples as well, oh, cool. mm. which um, I've got more things I'm going to do with this to look at the atomic distribution within each nanoparticle. That's the next stage. Do we have any other examples of this kind of technology being used in the Roman period anywhere? Um, there are. This is the only complete object, and that's the, one of the remarkable things. It survived time as a complete object. There in the in the VNA, there is a piece of um, dichroic glass about this sort of size from a vessel similar to this at a similar time, but it's not got this strong color and not got this very vivid color. And in all, I think there are about 10 documented pieces of glass all about this size, but nothing like this as a complete object. So... They will come from the same workshop, or do we have any idea about the tradition behind them? It seems extraordinarily no, no idea. high technology. I don't think they have any idea. They don't know where this was made. It could be that the speculation, um, the glass is very typical of a Roman glass of that time, so the, the native glass. And incidentally, I, the other day, um, I think I gave a talk on Monday in the, in the British Museum, and I saw a piece of the glass, it's untreated, and it's completely clear. And it's exactly the composition of this. And it's by this very clever heat treatment that they've done, and they knew how to do. Presumably, they worked out how to do. It's, it's incredible. Uh, the others have been analyzed chemically, um, but they kind of have a browny color and a gray green, nothing as vivid as this. Uh, it's a technical question. What kind of ions you use in FIBS? Um, in the, in, you mean for in the... In oh. what, what kind of ions? It was gallium or what? Gallium. gallium. Yeah, the, the instrument uses gallium ions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So... 
Just sort of expanding on, really interesting, and just to expand on what you were saying, you've got some other ideas and fancy plans. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the other bits which you'd like to explore and sort of what your end goal is, I yeah, guess? Yeah, please. so the, the first thing I intend to do is, this, this glass is very, very susceptible to beam damage. So if you leave, a, there's a, in some of the pictures, you can see there's a black hole. And if you leave, if you're in scanning mode and then you stop the scan and the, the scan goes to a point, it burns right through. So the beam is a incredibly beam sensitive. Um, and so I'm going to use them in a, in a cryo machine. And I'm going to do, uh, try to do automation so that you just get you know, one shot at the thing, you take the best picture you, you possibly can, and I'm trying to do, next stage is to look at the atomic resolution images of these. The other thing that I've got, um, I'm very popular because nobody else has got these specimens. So I'm getting offers from all sorts of people. And um, Imperial <laughs> College, I think I'm, yes, I'm pointing the right way. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just over here, there's a new, new instrument, and it's called an atom probe. And this atom probe, they can prepare a specimen, which is a column. And they could prepare a specimen, which is a column, which just contains one of these nanoparticles. And then they fire a beam of atoms at it, and they can image the atomic distribution of the atoms inside one of these nanoparticles. So, you know, that's, that's the holy grail for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Are we ever going to be able to work out how, how this was actually made? How they, how they managed to, to, to produce nanoparticles. We can see they're very difficult to see yeah. Yeah. Uh, with modern, modern, modern technology. So surely they wouldn't know, know what they were, were producing, but they must have discovered the effect. Yeah, they must have discovered the effect probably by accident. There's a lot of research. Glass was probably a commodity, a very rare commodity in those days. And so they must have recycled glass. And at the time, they were making tiles, I think they call them tesserae, which had a pinky color. And nobody's ever looked at it in this way. And it's thought that they might have taken these tiles and used them and put them as scrap into the melt for the, for the main glass. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a museum in... America, and I met somebody on Monday from this museum, and they've done some experimental glasses. So <clears throat> they made up some glass of exactly the same composition. That's what I saw on Monday, completely clear. And they produced a, a, a sort of cup-like shape, and then they did the heat treatment, and they've got a series of uh, experimental glasses that have gone through all the various different stages of the heat treatment, and the end result is something that's dichroic with green. Mm -hmm. So they know how to do it. We know how mm -hmm. to do it. They presumably mm -hmm. followed that same process, mm -hmm. and I've now got access to all these pieces of glass. That's, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to ask. Have you got access to those yeah. samples, and are you going to analyse those I'm and compare and them those. And it to tell, that? It will tell a fantastic story of watching mm -hmm. the nanoparticles develop in this in a multiple series of... They, they, they reduce the glass. And so there's, there's lots of salt, I can see. And what they did was they took the glass, they put salt in it, heated it again, cooled it down, looked at it, put more salt in, and that had the effect of making the nanoparticles go to exactly the right size to give this colour. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you can buy um, sort of research-grade nanoparticles in solution, and depending on the size, the color changes. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and so they stopped at exactly the right time to give this color. So was this, was this, this, this made as a piece of glass with a sort of constant thickness and then carved away? Yeah. 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 And that mm -hmm. in itself is absolutely remarkable. Yes. Yes. Any other questions? Very, very back. <laughs> Behind you, yes. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, have you s had the particles always separate? So there'll be separate silver and separate gold nanoparticles, or were there, uh, were there, uh, was there ever electrum, perhaps uh, um, fused together? All the particles are gold uh, or silver and gold, and 
initial evidence that I've got looks like there is gold at the center and the melting point of gold says that when you're going through this process probably this, the core of the nanoparticles is gold and then the silver's formed around the outside. There's never any go pure gold and there's never any um, pure, pure silver. And they're all roughly the same concentration but there are a few real extreme outliers which uh, I don't really understand. But yeah, and so it's very easy to tell, you know, how that, how that, as you, you just scan one particle whilst you have the EDX detector running, you can see. Thank you. Okay, I think, I think, I think we ought to stop there if we, if we could thank our, thank our speaker again.